Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Jen Goldsack. I'm the CEO here at the Digital Medicine Society, or DIME, and I am delighted uh, to welcome uh, a really nice group to our November Journal Club uh, conversation. Um, journal clubs are my favorite um, event on the monthly DIME calendar. They are a more sort of intimate opportunity for us to meet some experts who are leading the field through their research, through their publications, um, and to really welcome you guys who have dialed in today as leaders in our community to have a thoughtful conversation around um, the, uh, the new findings um, and what we do with those as a field. Um, so just for, for folks who may not have attended a journal club before, um, we're delighted you're here. Let's do some housekeeping quickly so you feel comfortable and you know how to sort of interact with our expert authors that we have on the line today. So first of all, full disclosure, um, our session today is being recorded. The nice thing about that, it does mean that we can post the recording later. It also means that um, we'll have the slides available up on the DIME website. We usually turn those pretty quickly. We also welcome conversation. We'll start with a bit of a, um, uh, a more, uh, some brief presentations, um, some behind the signs, behind the signs, behind the scenes from the author's point of view um, on this particular publication, you'll get to meet the authors. Um, but then we really do want to spend a good amount of time um, in Q&A and in discussion. Um, in order to do that, we'll invite you all to turn your cameras on, really participate in a conversation. Um, and there's a couple of ways you can pose questions to the authors we have on the line today. You can raise your hand, um, not like this, but in your uh, sort of participant bar in Zoom. Um, you can also type your questions into the chat and we'll be monitoring those as we go. So again, welcome everyone to our November Journal Club. And I want to particularly welcome um, uh, my co-authors and our expert colleagues um, who pushed this particular manuscript along. Um, the, the, the tagline we have is sort of show me the money. Um, what we will describe to you today is some of the research we did around uh, areas of focus and gaps in both uh, publications uh, relative to digital clinical measures, but also funding. Um, we'll reveal some of those findings to you that we published in our journal and we'll talk about the consequences together. But before we dive in, um, let me please call on uh, my expert colleagues, my co-authors to introduce themselves. And John, I wonder if you would mind going first. Sure, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for, for having me here. Uh, my name is John Petania. I am the Program Director for the Brown Lifespan Center for Digital Health uh, based in Providence, Rhode Island. Fantastic. Um, John, really delighted you're here. It was an honor to work with you on this and with the playbook more broadly. Um, Mo Bashir, you are the first author on this. You are our fearless leader. Please go ahead, introduce yourself. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, I'm Mobashir Shandi. I am a postdoc uh, in a big ideas lab in the Biomedical Engineering Department uh, at Duke University. Fantastic. Thanks, Mubashe. Jessalyn, you bookended the publication as our senior author also from Duke. Do you want to go ahead and say hi? Sure. Um, thanks so much, Jen and Dean, for organizing this um, great journal club. And um, I'm Jessie Lynn Dunn, assistant professor at Duke in biomedical engineering and biostatistics and bioinformatics. Um, we were really interested in, in this and in understanding what's going on in in the literature, in the academic uh, space. And so Jen and Jean helped us to, to lead the way to asking some really key questions. So thanks very much. And thanks everyone for your interest in this topic. Fantastic. Thanks, Jessalyn. Simona, do you want to go next? Um, hi, um, my name is Simona Carini. I am a data scientist at OpenM Health at UCSF. Delighted to be here with all of you this morning. Fantastic. Um, thanks, Simona. Um, and Jean, I'm going to come to you next. And it's uh, it's intentional to sort of tee you up as the last of the co-authors sort of introducing yourself here. Um, colleagues on the line, all of this work came out of a phenomenal body of work we did together on the playbook. There was a particular dossier that was dedicated to understanding the academic landscape. And that wasn't just the researchers themselves, but also the funding mechanism, so on and so forth. So Jean, I wonder if you can introduce yourself. You were important on this particular project. You're also my amazing strong partner in sort of moving the playbook forward. If you want to introduce yourself and then I'll move ahead um, and put up a slide on the playbook so you can tell folks uh, more broadly about that initiative. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, really excited to be here and have this conversation with all of you. Uh, so I'm Jean Shang and I am program manager here at DIME and I had the illustrious privilege of leading the playbook, uh, this entire tour of duty that resulted in um, a whole suite of resources and in particular the one we're talking about today, which is the system, um, systematic review, um, uncovering what we, where we are in um, academic research and where we not want, where we need to go. For the playbook overall, I'm sure most of the members here uh, know the playbook. Uh, for those of you who don't or want a little bit of um, deeper orientation is, the playbook is a suite now, um, a suite of resources living on its own website. 100, over 100 fit for purpose, action oriented resources. It's a blue ribbon initiative DIME and really represents what DIME does best. It brings expert collaborators together to identify what they think they need to be done in order to move the field forward and let the experts really drive what's important for them from their perspectives and their own pain points. And the playbook itself is, as Jen mentioned, is organized around dossiers. Um, and here we're talk, we are going to talk about that specific um, resource in the academia dossier. And I think from my perspective, what's really so valuable about this is that it was a challenge for the group to identify where we are today. In order to know where we need to go, we have to understand where we are today. And that's really what um, the paper re represents for us and gives us great opportunity for further growth and advancement. Jean, that was a tremendous overview. There was an enormous work, amount of work that happened with tremendous partners um, during the course of the playbook. I think there was a really nice overview and a really sort of important transition to our area of focus today, which is this publication in JIMA, this systematic review of academic research in the US, um, sort of what is current state. So I'm gonna share just a couple of key findings um, from the publication, and then we'll throw it open to a discussion. Um, one of the most important things, I'm gonna just advance this one, um, is that uh, these are sort of the key findings here. We were particularly interested in saying, um, in sort of benchmarking the field. And here are our findings. So a couple of headline pieces that are important. This did focus primarily on um, the academic research currently happening in the US. That was simply a scoping decision. I do think it would be interesting and important to explore this in rest of the world. But um, so you are clear the findings that you're looking at here on the screen are based on sort of academic research in the US. How do we define academic research? Um, that was based on um, sort of the presence of authors who had um, an affiliation with a US academic institution. So that's how we went through, that's how we found this research. So in some cases there may have been industry partnerships, so on and so forth, but it was sort of embedded um, in uh, sort of academic scholarship. We also looked at the last two years only, and that was intentional because we wanted to be reporting sort of current trends. This is a field that's moving really quickly. So as we went to the literature, we sort of um, did a review of the last two years of publications. I think the other and most important piece is this is not digital health tremendously broadly. This is really thinking about digital clinical measures and what questions are being asked and answered by our academic colleagues with respect to um, digital clinical measures. And in some ways the findings were fantastic and in some ways they were quite alarming. Let's dive into those quickly as they will be the sort of um, foundation of our conversation. What I found to be really encouraging and in fact all of us as co-authors were thrilled to see was that the upfront sort of research to ensure that these um, sort of digital measurement tools are sort of high performing pieces of technology is being really well done. Most importantly, there is a groundswell of work asking questions around what should we even be measuring in the first place? So out of um, you know, the, the sum total of studies, which I believe, and Mobashir, correct me if I'm misspeaking, was about 275 total studies that we reviewed, 71 of them were sort of exploring, you know, what's the right thing we should be measuring here? We also saw a number of studies that were um, working through the V3 process. So we saw a lot of publication around the verification step, analytical validation, which is really important to show that we are measuring indeed what we claim to be measuring. Um, and as uh, Jessalyn, you and Robichir do a lot of work in your lab, 
Are we measuring it well across the entire population in which this is intended for use? We see a lot of that kind of work happening. We see the clinical validation. Can we actually interpret what this new data point means vis-a-vis -vis someone's health? We're starting to see a good amount of work on usability and utility. That's great because it doesn't matter if you can measure something really well, if it's undeployable. Um, coupled with that, we see the sort of ops considerations really shining through. This to us was really encouraging. This was a really strong signal in the field that we are developing high performing tools. Where the gap came down was, are they trustworthy and are they scalable? And the scalable piece, and Simona will speak to this as this is her area of expertise, is of all of those um, sort of studies and publications, we saw only six that addressed questions around sort of standards vis-a-vis -vis digital clinical measures. Worse, there was not a single publication that addressed the ethical considerations that specifically link to the development and deployment of digital clinical measures and remote monitoring. We saw just one paper that considered issues uh, relative to data rights, governance and privacy, and just one paper that addressed the security considerations um, around sort of uh, preventing unauthorized access both to the software and to the data these tools generate. Um, this was something that despite all of this good progress and the groundswell of research we see in some areas that are fundamental to success, we absolutely have blind spots. What is really encouraging is that as a result of the work, we get to have conversations with all of you on the line today, we get to explore this together. It was also really well recognized by the field through the media and a variety of different commentaries people took notice of these findings. Um, one of the questions I hope we get to address as a team together today is how do we move forward from here? When we look at these gaps, how on earth do we handle that? Um, but before we, throw, before we get to those questions, um, and I am monitoring the chat here because I want to make sure that, um, oh, and Mobashe, you correct me, thank you. 295 papers total. Um, Jessalyn, I want to come to you first. I think there's a really interesting sort of origin story into why we did this work in the first place. Do you want to talk to folks on the line a little bit about sort of, it, it, from your perspective as a leader in the field, as an academician, as someone running a lab, what your hypotheses were going into this and why you felt this work was important in the first place? Yeah, thanks, Jen, for um, giving all of that background and, and sort of teeing that question up of, of why uh, were we interested in this to begin with? Um, you know, I think we in my lab at Duke had been submitting many, many grants and um, trying to get research funded in an area that is non-traditional. Um, this is something that is outside of what our typical funding agencies see and kind of know how to evaluate and deal with. And I think that that's true of burgeoning fields. So it's exciting to be on the cutting edge, but it's also challenging in trying to uh, be clear about what problems exist and should be studied. So we found ourselves in my lab uh, going and doing a lot of research sort of unfunded um, on our, our own dime, on our own time. Um, and because we had questions that we felt were really important. Um, and then that started to beg the question of, we see a lot of studies coming out in this space, but anecdotally, the funding sources don't seem to always be clear. We see that industry is leading a lot of the charge and that's fantastic, um, but, but we do wanna make sure that there's um, an academic perspective that is involved as well. So that's where we started to ask the question, what is the academic research that's happening in this space? How is it being supported? And is there anything that we should be aware of with understanding that landscape? So that's that's what kicked all of this off. Um, and and I think Jen, you you saw this problem too, and said let's let's answer this. Um, Jessalyn, just riffing on that a little bit before we come to some of our other colleagues, we sort of went in with this hypothesis around sort of funding. Were you surprised by the findings? What we saw was, you know, there was a lot of institutional driven funding here. What sort of, it, it, tell me about your reaction to the findings and what you think we actually need to be doing as a field to self-advocate for or more um, fit for purpose sort of um, RFAs and RFPs in the digital area of health. Yeah, and so I think in a lot of ways, what we found was in line with what we expected, which is that um, 
some of the broader areas of digital health that are really important aren't really being funded and supported in a way that um, is sustainable. So when we talk about institutional funding, when we talk about um, you know, um, even foundation funding, that's still a limited pool. And so we really do need to get the, um, the sort of government agencies that typically fund research to understand the link between digital health and their missions and why supporting research on digital health is so important. And we've seen some examples of that. And so in our literature review, we found that you know, there were institutes at the NIH that are funding disease specific research on certain digital topics, uh, digital health topics, um, but that this is not really true across the board yet. And so I think we need some more systematic methods of digital health being recognized as a fundable and important topic for these agencies. Um, Jessalyn, you, you, you articulated that really nicely. And Simona, I wonder if we can come to you. So if you think about what you've been doing at Open M Health, at UCSF, like you've been working tire tirelessly on these sorts of standards. The challenge then becomes, um, it, in my opinion, and correct me if I'm misspeaking, is if we're focusing on sort of verticals defined by therapeutic area, because that's how the National Institutes of Health sort of funding awards are done. How does this cross cutting work, such as the work that's needed around sort of data standards, ontologies, how does that come forward? You think about something like physical activity, which cuts across all of these different um, sort of disease states. Tell me about sort of your reaction to seeing such a, a paucity of, of, of published and funded research on um, sort of data standards. Yes. Uh so just to give a perspective, OpenM Health was uh, fun founded in 2011, and our um, we uh, received a grant to work on standards, a three-year grant in 2018 that just uh, we completed this year. So just to give a perspective, you know, we we did work for seven years uh, trying, you know, alternative uh, types of funding, and that's because. Early on, the funders of uh, OpenM Health, Dr. Ida Sim, Dr. Deborah Estrin, recognized that where digital health was going and that standards would become incredibly important. Now, in 2011, 2012, it was hard to uh, move forward that discussion. People are realizing slowly how important uh, they are. And so I think the landscape uh, you know, is slowly moving in the right direction. Um, thanks to, you know, I, I have, you know, my shout out is to NIH that funded our work for three years, start, so that's NIBIP, that they realized that this is really happening. And as, as we all know, in the last year and a half, uh, things have also, you know, increased in speed. But the, the, yeah. the, um, the need to uh, work on standards, to agree on standards of many kinds, we're focused on standard representation of data, just increases a pace and does not get solved you know, by itself. So the results are not surprising. I hope they're eye-opening also for you know, other people involved. Uh, definitely, you know, the federal agencies have, have a, um, you know, um, sort of they are ahead, but I, I also hope that it's, there's also coming contributions from other players, the other players that we saw, including foundations and, and, and industry. And they, they don't look, as you just said, only at specific, um, you know, as verticals because standards go across and we find, you know, new digital biomarkers where, you know, we don't totally expect them. We need to, to not look at, you know, this, this sort of, you know, verticals, but look at standard representation across, because once we agree on them, then everybody um, uh, benefits from these agreed upon, you know, data representation. Fantastic. No, I, I, I think that's really important. And I want to come, um, and Alexis, if you're somewhere where you can unmute yourself, if you want to ask your question live, um, this is a much better question for John than I was going to pose to him myself. So, uh, 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 Alexis, if you don't know, John works at the uh, 
and John, I'll let you describe this yourself in a second, uh, the Brown Lifespan Center for Digital Health, which is a really interesting group because it sits at the interface of sort of applied healthcare and academic research. So please, Alexis, go ahead, um, introduce yourself, ask your question, and John, I'll let you take a first cut and then we'll let the rest of the panelists pile on. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexis Carmer. I'm an anesthesiologist. I work at CDRH. I've been there for about five years. I review um, anesthesia and critical care devices. Um, so right now, as far as um, these monitors, I, I, mon I review pulse oximeters, respiratory rate monitors, uh, um, some accelerometers for certain clinical studies. Um, so from my perspective, I guess it wasn't really a question, but a point. Um, I think a lot of the research that was especially done during COVID out of necessity um, with some healthcare systems that were concerned about what devices um, that they could, you know, were accurate enough for their patients to be using outside of the hospital. I know that there was a fair amount of research done on testing those devices and it hasn't been published. Um, I'm working with the standards group and a, a lot of the um, clinical testing laboratories and academic testing laboratories, and um, we're all working on the standards and the changes that are required by these different uses and different um, uh, where you know different forms of the monitors uh, wearables. And I'm encouraging them to publish some of the this data that they've um, they've been working on. Alexis, I think that's a really good insight. John, as you stand with sort of one foot in a healthcare system that just as Alexis described, you know, would have had a voracious appetite over the last year and a half to figure out what tools we can safely deploy at home, sort of under pressure and an academic institution responsible for really helping us ensure that these tools are trustworthy. Like, can you talk about that tension a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Alexis, thank you so much for, for that comment. And to uh, just provide a, provide a little context, the Center for Digital Health, we are dual affiliated with Brown University and Lifespan Healthcare Systems, which is the largest hospital system based in Rhode Island. Um, it, it's uniquely placed in this, in, in terms of the academic sphere and the healthcare sphere, where we have access to the latest and greatest in, in research, as well as the clinicians and consumers, patients, healthcare system um, on the hospital side. I think that, uh, Alexis, to your point, in the past you know, couple of years in, in, in the height of COVID, it's um, digital health and specifically digital, digital clinical measures have been put on this um, accelerated kind of fast track to get um, not only kind of the validation out there, the verification to make sure that we're measuring you know what we need to measure. Um, the the tension that comes up is that there is again not enough funding, but it's the 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 ethics and the security and um, the governance of these digital clinical measures are not top of mind right now. Part of that is because digital health is such um, an is such a, an advanced field. It's the, the the new frontier of kind of digital uh, of healthcare and the, the, the delivery of health. Um, that sometimes we need to take a step back and and kind of ask ourselves: Are we doing this ethically? Are we doing this? Right is the is the methods is the protection of of, of data um, is that top of mind when researchers and researchers and clinicians kind of think through this. I think that um, this is an opportunity for industry foundations um, federal federal funding to realize that um, here is the gap here is where we can kind of take a step back and make sure that we address these very core issues. I think that academic medical centers have a responsibility to the community and to the public to build that trust to uh, make sure that um, you know we as academic researchers as, as clinicians we all have that mindset of let's make sure we're doing things right but that translation to the community and to the public is sometimes missing and um when you know um studies and publications um is one way to get it out there that yes we did do the research we we did make sure that, that we are addressing this um and i think that's where myself and and the colleagues at um 
uh, on this call can can really make an impact. Um, John, really thoughtful remarks. Alexis, when you sort of are encouraging folks who are building these tools, who are thinking about these tools to sort of publish in the academic literature, you know, that's a drum we, we bang pretty hard at Dime. Um, you know, this should be an evidence-based field. Do you, um, do you have any insights into what concerns might be, into what sort of barriers might be to getting um, a lot of the sort of bench and lab research that is done in product development um, into the peer-reviewed literature? Do you have any insights on that at all? Hmm. Well, I, most of my experience is with a very specific um, device with pulse oximeters, and there's just a few labs. Um, Duke uh, does has a hypoxia lab, UCSF, um, and then there's one commercial lab in Colorado called Clinimark that those three do the majority of the testing in the US. And um, as far as, so from that specific area, um, the, I, I know that they want to get a lot of information. Phil Bickler is an anesthesiologist that runs the hypoxia lab at UCSF. And I think it's just a matter of, he has had a paper out recently um, looking um, he was involved um, with uh, verification of a smartphone um, pulse oximeter, um, and, and some of that was published. I know there were other authors, but I, I think they get things. I don't think there's huge barriers for them. I think on the other side, if companies are funding the research, um, that is less likely to um, to be published because it's, um, you know, part of their applications and proprietal. Mm -hmm. um, exactly, and I think one of the interesting things, and and it's a, it's an idea we we continue to explore at Dime, which is what what's the optimal breakdown of what belongs essentially in the pre-competitive space, whether that's industry consortia, whether that's industry publishing or whether that's looking to our academic colleagues to say, hey, for example, there's an enormous gap around ethical considerations. There may not be sufficient funding for this. There may not be the patience or the incentives to do this in a sort of fast paced sort of VC funded world. Um, it's the responsibility of our academic colleagues to make sure that we do this right. Um, and then creating the, the incentives around that. Um, Abby, you had a really um, nice uh, comment in the chat here. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask that um, live? Absolutely. Uh, I will be honest, I have not skimmed the research paper completely. I was just doing it earlier on the call. Uh, so thank you for, for this opportunity. And my question is basically about, I, I completely concur with so many things that have been said and that are between the the like more related to the ops area of digital health, but wondering what is the key specific message that and how should we share it with funders? Because it's a big challenge in convincing some of the program officers on why this is super important beyond the, the scientific theory and the underpinnings of what these can tell, but who are we collecting it from? What are the operational challenges and the data quality? But it's incredibly hard to get that funded, at least for some of us. Um, Abby, I'll, I'll throw a few thoughts on the table from the dime side, but curious to hear from my colleagues and also from other experts on the line as well, who were sort of tuned in for the discussion. You know, I think this is why it was we were so thrilled, for example, to see the sort of the media pickup, right, and the, the engagement with these findings. This is, you know, there has to be, I think, a groundswell of reaction to these gaps and one of the things we spend a lot of time at dime doing is some of the storytelling around you know what happens if we allow these gaps to continue to exist right this is a, a quite frankly compared to other areas of sort of healthcare this is still a nascent subfield of digital health and the story that i tell is that we haven't got this wrong yet there is an in, the enormous amount of promise to take these tools to really reimagine how we define health and disease and to even reimagine healthcare because we're able to sort of monitor and assess people um, sort of outside of the clinic. We could imagine a future state where good healthcare isn't about how we swoop in and help people once they're sick and they present themselves at the clinic, but rather we can sort of imagine a healthcare system where good healthcare is 
How good are we at keeping people out of the hospital? How good are we at stopping them from getting sick in the first place? All of this is possible. Dramatic improvements in access, dramatic improvements in equity, dramatic, um, I don't want to say reductions in cost because I'm okay with investing in healthcare, but we can actually make sure that for the dollars we spend, we actually get good health as a consequence. And we don't have that now. But I think if we continue to have these gaps around um, sort of ethics, we are going to harm people. If we continue to ignore security risks and data rights issues and not acknowledge them as being the patient safety issues of the digital era of medicine, we are going to harm people. And if we don't do thoughtful things around standards, we are going to end up with every single clinician dealing with 500 point solutions that don't speak to each other. And if we thought the pain of a decade of introducing EHR was bad, we ain't seen nothing yet. Like, I think that's the point we need to make. And I actually, you know, I welcome thoughts from folks on the line around, you know, how on earth do we sort of bring this? And, you know, Dime's not an advocacy organization, but we'll go and knock on the door if whoever you tell us. Who do we talk to about this? Abby, is it the program officers? Like, Jessalyn, when you think about sort of advocating for the kind of work you do at the lab, who are you speaking to? Yeah, I mean, I think Jen, you hit the nail on the head. And to Abby's question, I'm thinking about it kind of on the other side, there's also an element of basic research to all of this, that when we think about what we expect our tax dollars to be funding, a, a portion of that is basic research and understanding how things work and how we can apply them. I think, you know, we have the prime example of the mRNA vaccine, that that grew out of this basic research on mRNA that had nothing to do with vaccines or infectious disease, but was just understanding the way systems work. And, you know, we can continue to remind, I think, program officers to remind, um, you know, various folks at these funding agencies that an element of this is considered basic research, but it fits within this larger vision of building technologies that will serve human health. Um, but uh, Jen, I have the same question as you, which is who else do we need to tell? Um, you know, because we can talk to the program officers, we can try to get the word out, but it, it is sometimes feeling a little bit like you know, yelling into a void, uh, this is a problem, we need people to fund it, but how do we get, um, how do we get that sort of acceleration going? Uh, I think still an open question for us to brainstorm as a group. Isabel, go ahead. Yeah, and no, I, as someone who's worked as a funder before and in funding organizations before and at universities, for example, within strategy, I think one of the, at least the key issues that I see is, is like um, Justin also was mentioning is that the problem with funding, and this is like, I've worked in it more than 10 years ago and then over the years, it hasn't really changed. It's very much bucket funded. So for example, the problem with a lot of, when I was working in academia then again for academics was that for interdisciplinary research, it kind of gets shifted. Once the project comes in, it's like, oh, is it healthcare? No, it's IT. Oh, it's, is it engineering? No. And so it kind of gets moved around and in the end it doesn't get funded. And as long as those buckets do not change from a policy level or from a funding agency level, I mean, you can keep talking to a lot of the program officers. And when I was working at a funder that was happening, but as long as nothing happens on a higher level, essentially nothing will happen. And that interdisciplinary research, especially, like biomedical engineering, uh, digital health, anything that kind of crosses different fields will always be on the back foot of not being funded in the end because there's only so much funding that is available to fund overall. So, um, so yeah, I think it's very much like a policy level that needs to change as well before we are able to tackle everything else. Yeah, so. Isabel, that's really interesting. Oh, Jesslyn, go ahead. Okay, I, I guess, Isabel, I think that that point is, is so, so, so well taken. And what's interesting is that there is the NIBIB, the NIBIB Center that Simona had mentioned um, that funded OpenM Health. Simona, if I'm getting the year correctly, was it 2011? 20, 
Oh, you're, no, you're no, the grant, the grant, the grant was uh, from in 2018, 2018 to 2021. So we okay. just, we just finished the grant. That, okay. That's, okay. And okay. That, that was a grant that really uh, funded our standards work. And we did the IEEE work with that. So, but before that, um, you know, it took some years to get there. <laughs> yeah, and so and so, I think that that is where we want to be going. Is that you know, NIBIB maybe recognizes digital health as a major component of their um, funding portfolio. But right now, the challenge is that these are kind of one-off studies. So there's not a ton of funding that's being poured into digital health, and there's no formalization of that. Um, so, so I think, you know, there, there is a program officer who is, has digital health as a part of a much larger portfolio of things that she funds. Um, but, but we really don't have this, it, it, it does get divided up. It's, it, is this a cardiovascular or is this a, uh, optics, right there? It, it, it's, we are inherently interdisciplinary and there's no, um, funding mechanism for that right now that is sort of generalized that's not kind of one-off examples and the interesting corollary to this is i think about sort of what we see at dime on a sort of um i don't know if industry is the right word but sort of on the implementation side if you like is Two years ago, I would have people coming to me and say, you know, for our healthcare system or for our pharmaceutical company, here's our strategic plan and here's digital, it's a pillar. And I was like, this is awful. Digital isn't a pillar. More digital, which can only be the aim at the top of a strategic plan that has digital as a pillar, is not the solution. It is a toolbox. It cuts across everything you are doing. When we think about flows of data, when we think about our analytics capabilities, when we think about the tools um, that constitute digital clinical measures, they are tools in the toolbox that cut across. What's really interesting is I don't get those questions and I don't see those strategic plans from industry or from our implementer colleagues sort of any longer. Over the last year and a half, there's been a seed change. There's been a realization that actually we're moving into, it's gonna be like computers in business, right? Digital flows of data, analytical capabilities, these kinds of tools and resources, that's what the digital era of health is. Um, and so I wonder whether that could maybe help drive some of the transitions that we're hoping to see in the funding mechanisms, which is, you know, on the implementation side, we've started to see a realization of what digital even is and what it means. Can we keep petitioning for funding mechanisms and sort of funders to take a similar approach? Alexis, really interesting comment here in the in the chat. Do you want to give voice to that? <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure that's a question you can say no to. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I just um, have to be careful and preface with I'm speaking um, not for my agency. I'm speaking from just my for personally. Um, this is one of the biggest concerns I have with this, what I'm seeing with this kind of rampant collection of data in huge, you know, huge amounts of population data. And that transition, I mean, the balance is we want to encourage innovation, uh, but I, I, I see often a lack of people even considering the unintended consequences um, when we don't know what is normal in this data, we don't know how accurate the data collection methods are. Um, you know, this is just really a big concern for me and um, finding the right balance of being able to collect that data and then how do we understand it before we try to start implementing it. I think that's exactly right. And frankly, Alexis, that's why that's why our findings give me particular pause. The fact that all of this, um, you know, the research, the, the V3 sort of work is happening, which has a voracious appetite for data, that that's all forging ahead. And we see really good, high quality work there to make sure that we're sort of measuring accurate things, but we know it's consuming data, but that we aren't seeing the work around data rights keep keep pace. We aren't seeing the work around making sure that these tools and their connections are secure, keep pace. I think that, 
you know, even if that was happening, your question and, and your concern would be well founded. And, and we have an opportunity now, we have an opportunity to build this field intentionally and correctly for all individuals. But the fact that we see this lag while the other areas sort of with this appetite for data sort of forge ahead is alarming. And I think this circles back to, I think what we're all passionate about is um, uh, sort of really doing this well and making sure that the funding mechanisms are available for our academic colleagues who are the bedrock of trust and in scientific innovation sort of are able to do what they do really well. Um, Abby, do you want to, um, do you want to sort of weigh in with your comment here as well? I think this is really thoughtful too. Yeah, I can sprinkle some more thoughts on that. So I guess in some studies, especially in LMIC, low and middle income countries, uh, I've had the pleasure of hearing from participants who were very kind enough to say, why are you doing this? Like, why do you want to collect this data from me and I'm not going to give it to you? It really sort of intrudes my mental health, privacy and that sort of stuff. And, and since I work in that space. And it, and it took me a while to sort of explain that. And then and the realization was, oh, we, we really don't know why. And that's okay to say, right? Like some of the studies are exploratory for that purpose. Like we need to see what's associated and whatnot. But I think my problem is when sometimes we <laughs> are not fully transparent about it because there's a lot of primary and secondary data collection going on in the field. And what, what happens sometimes is the exploratory endpoints or secondary endpoints can actually impact people's willingness to join or continue in the studies. And that could impact the primary endpoints indirectly or directly. So long story short, um, all comes back to being parsimonious about what you're collecting and really understanding who you are reaching out to and will they be willing to share that data. And in my line of work, it is super critical because it's mental health and anything can get very sensitive very easily. Um, so anyways, I, I just, uh, Alex, is what you were saying, I so resonate with that in terms of understanding the why behind what we are doing and then hopefully being able to explain it to participants transparently on what we don't know, we don't know. Yeah, Abby, I want to add to this, this comment as well. So I, I appreciate, um, Alex and Abby, your, your um, kind of thoughts and concerns here because it, we face the same thing at the Center for Digital Health. We also do um, mental health related studies um, as well as social media um, kind of research. So we actually um, download um, adolescents' social media data. So I, I, hear me out on this, but just to kind of extrapolate the, 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 um, the concern here. Parents, participants, um, especially those who are, who are um, adolescents, they don't know what we're doing with the data. Of course, the informed consent form says it's, you know, protected and everything. Um, but the question of like, how do we ensure that and build that trust um, with these participants? So extrapolate that to digital clinical measures and, and our kind of discussion here. Um, I, I understand Brown's and Lifespan's um, kind of security system. So I am confident of how we're protecting the data, but let's um, again, think bigger picture. If, um, if industry partners, if other kind of organizations are saying, you know, um, here's the app, um, here's how I'm collecting heart rate or geolocation or whatever it may be, um, how do we translate that we are actually keeping that that data safe. I think again, going back to the paper, this highlights well. Is this an opportunity for um, particularly industry partners to say, yeah, let's let's put in some RFPs and RFAs to show that um, that we are keeping things safe. Um, I, I think that as this discussion of, especially in the federally funded um, space, there are these buckets that you have to kind of meet um and sometimes the digital health space let alone ethics and security fall out of those buckets so here's an opportunity for foundations for philanthropic um, organizations for for industry to say this is what's missing in the field um let's intentionally put out this rfa rfp to have researchers and clinicians study this to not only prove within their own system that we are keeping things um, secure and private and thinking about the ethics, but how we can kind of push the needle that it's in, in addition to validation and the, the V3 things, um, also this um, this space that's that's really needed. 
John, I really like those reflections and I like that you um, are encouraging us to think about the full landscape of where sort of funding comes from and the full landscape of folks working within the field. Jean, I wonder if I can come to you a little bit and um, I will certainly um, happily own that when we started this second body of work on the playbook, this an academia dossier wasn't even on my mind, right? And then sort of pursuing on sort of breakneck pace, a literature review, we were happy to do it, but it wasn't on our mind. I think this shows the power of sort of convening um, in the pre-conservative space, these multi-stakeholder groups. Dean, do you want to talk a little bit about sort of what you see as the power of um, these other, perhaps not traditional academic organizations, but sort of groups like um, dime sort of initiatives like the playbook and being able to help us continue to uncover these trends and continuing to advocate for them. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's um, it is a really unique, unique space that dime has created for people to come. And I think through the kind of the recent history, dime's only been two around for two years, but really the success is what dime's been able to deliver in high impact products and um, being able to show when people do come together. And in particular in the playbook, we've aligned, it was a bit of just like this amorphous blob when we started, let's just admit that. And over time we aligned um, around areas of expertise and it wasn't um, pr like prescriptive, like we didn't go down a very particular path and said, okay, what are the pain points and had a very open conversation of like what we need to do. And it happened in, along all the dossiers. And I think that was what was super cool about it because the end result is every dossier is entirely unique. The tools are different, the problem sets are different, who would use them, why and when, and for what purpose, completely different. And so here we are with the academic dossier and we said like, okay, look, what's the deal? Like, what is happening? And I think what was so cool about that is that it really was the most important question. Like what has been done? Where are we now? What does it look like? So we can have informed, we meaning all the academic, academics on the call, not me, but so we can make these informed decisions about really what to do next and what the impact is. And it's, it's facilitating this conversation of like, what are the funders like? What, what are the inherent problems in the funding system? What are we pushing up against? Like this feel that we're, it's like moving so fast. It's like very complex and multidisciplinary. Like what are the things in this kind of conversation is a beautiful result of that work. Um, I really like that. And I really like how you described, Jean, sort of the focusing on the problems, but also benchmarking current state. I think that's exactly what got us to this work um, that got us to these findings. And I think that now we've benchmarked, right? We've identified a new problem set, right? That there are these gaps in research and now we need to solve for that issue. Um, I really like how you described that, Jean. Um, Mobishir, I want to make sure that we spend some time hearing from you because you were the lead author on all of this. You know, you're a postdoc, you have this sort of, you know, flourishing career already. When you look at this landscape of sort of digital health and you think about building your career here, how do you interpret some of these findings? How do you think about sort of directing your expertise and your work in this environment? Uh, thank you, uh, Jean, for the question. So I'm an electrical engineer by uh, my training. And when as an electrical engineer, uh, who works with like biomedical sensor development. Most of my work was involved with sensor development, signal processing and machine learning type of work. So we are more concerned about, I would say hardware security, like whether that is safe to use for a particular patient group or subject population. However, we don't think a lot about the later part of it, meaning like when you collect the data or we have that data, how to maintain the security and safety of that data. So that is one thing that came to my mind when I was doing this review. So I think that is very important for us. Uh, as a like a fresh engineer when they're in the training phase to think about that, like how to maintain that safety and security. So that was one thing I that came to my mind. Another thing was when I'm doing my postdoc, I'm, I'm involved in multiple other studies and in one of the studies also, and through this systematic review as well, we have seen that a lot of the studies, they don't publish their demographics, meaning like whether this sensor or technology that they are building, whether it will work across the board, we are not sure about that. So the ethical use of these AI tools that we are developing, we are still lagging behind on that in, uh, like implementation of that. So for example, uh, Alexis, you were mentioning something regarding uh, pulse oximetry. So there was a paper last year actually that got published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine uh, from University of uh, uh, Michigan Hospital System. So they have 
uh, shown that uh, the pulse oximeter that used in the hospital compared to the arterial blood, blood oxygen saturation that they're measuring from these patients. And they have seen significantly different uh, occult hypoxia among white versus black people. So meaning like the sensor that we are using so robustly or so common that sensor we are using in the hospital as well as outside the hospital, this pulse oximetry, it can, it's not implemented or we, we are not sure yet whether it will work similarly across different races. So you can imagine that consumer wearable device and a lot of cases, they are not letting us know like what is the subject population. So we don't have that faith like, can I use that to make any sort of decision making? Because with COVID, a lot of people, they are buying pulse oximetry and based on their oxygen situation, they are thinking whether I am sick or not, whether I should go to a clinician or should I stay home or that sort of decision. So we are making clinical decision. However, the sensor or technology we are using, we are not yet sure whether that works perfectly across the board. So I think this is a critical gap that the funders should come forward and all the people involved, meaning like academia, industry, all of us should come forward and make sure like we are using these tools ethically and make sure like we are transparent in the development of these tools and technologies. Can I comment on that? Um, well, sure, thank you. I'm very, very familiar. Um, that actually was not a paper, but a letter to the Literally. editor. Yeah. Um, I'm very familiar. Uh, there was also a congressional inquiry about that. Um, so we've been working for the last nine, 10 months with extensively with in the agency and with our partners in standards groups, the manufacturers, the academicians, the testing labs to understand this. Um, there, there are a lot of problems with the way they gathered the data it was a retrospective review and you have to understand how we verify the accuracy of pulse oximeters to really understand. I won't get into all of the, the issues with the data that they use, but it is important and a, a point that I hope to get out at some point that we have to be careful with using data in with these monitors in certain ways and make sure we understand the comparisons thoroughly before I'm, um, you know, there, there is an issue um, that we're investigating with the accuracy of pulse oximeters that has to do with skin pigmentation. But the data as presented there has a lot of problems and um, the conclusions that were made are not necessarily what is found with other types of tests, but it's very complicated. Um, I assure you that a lot of people are researching. I completely agree with your sentiment that we need to make sure that these devices work in all populations, um, but it's a very complicated topic. Alexis, I would actually love to um, ask some more questions about that because it sounds like there is a lot of work underway and, I guess if, if we or the general public wanted to learn more about that, how could we? So, um, you want to know what, uh, what work manufacturers are doing and researchers um, as far as that specific topic, like the the yeah, issue so with skin be, pigmentation. Yeah, I mean that that that's one I think example, but this is something that we think about a lot is um sort of the 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 V3, the verification, validation. Um how do we know what is underway, what is being done, particularly if it's not in the published literature? Is there another way that we could go about learning about this? So um you know, I think at Duke, you can probably talk to David McLeod uh, and he can help you a little bit um, with some information as far as the type of testing that's being done. Um, a lot of that is very manufacturer specific. Um, I know that the FDA is also working on some studies more specifically to look at issues with labeling and use of pulse oximeters in the over-the-counter type situation. So we are doing some of our own research that the results are not 
available at this point. The standards group is another, um, you know, that brings all the stakeholders together. Um, and we're mid review in the process of updating uh, the standard and that will become public. Um, at the FDA, we're in the process of potentially, you know, we're gathering, we're having network of expert opinion at this point. I would like to have a panel on this specific topic, but, you know, given all the issues that are happening related to COVID, it's just a time issue with everyone. Uh, but we do plan on updating the guidance. All of this is happening right now, and it's, it's difficult. Um, you know, I, 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 it's not available to you right now, the, all of this information, um, but it will be soon. And it's my goal because I feel the urgency with all of these digital health devices and so many of them relying on um, pulse oximetry. I mean, right now off pulse oximetry, you can get pulse rate, oxygen saturation, blood pressure, Hemoglobin with some of the devices, carboxyhemoglobin. Uh, what, what have I forgotten? Um, respiratory rate. So um, I'm, I'm concerned too that we get, a, there's a, many other issues besides just this skin pigmentation issue. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's issues with the over-the-counter type devices that don't have FDA clearance. We're working on those issues. There's issues with how do you, um, you know, kind of your, I, I, I've actually been sending your paper to sponsors and different people around the agency, your V3, because it's not just the clinical verification that we do, but I mean, sorry, the, the, the verification on healthy volunteers or what we call the desaturation test, but also if it's going to be used in, you know, out by over the counter, there's much more that needs to be done to validate the device and the in the indication. So I'm we're it's we're all working on it. Um, I, I that's why I contacted Jennifer and hopefully we can open the channels of communication and I'll be able to give you more more information that way. Um, such a fabulous discussion, everyone. And to pile on there, Alexis, one of the other things we spoke about and some folks on the line here are involved with is our data CC initiative. So, um, you know, really our collaborative community, Alexis, with your um, other colleagues um, in CDRH at the Center for Digital Health, um, really we are diving hard into these issues around equity and inclusion when it comes to digital product, digital measurement product development and deployment. But I'm conscious of time. I know that everyone lives in a back-to-back -back Zoom world. So um, I want to let everyone go. Thank you everyone for being on the line today. Before I thank my co-authors who joined us on the line, I do want to celebrate something really important about this collaboration. Mobashir, you mobilized a fearless group of Duke students to help us do this really well, to do the really high quality data extraction, to make sure we had multiple reviewers at every point during this review. And I want to recognize Will Wang Kyle Ryan, Alexander, uh, Alexandra uh, Benian, Adita Coulter, um, Alina Feng, um, and Yinghang Jiang for their incredibly hard work on this. We could not have done it without them. It was an honor to work with the next generation of experts in digital health and um, to bring them with us on this journey. Thank you everyone for being on the line today. John, Mobashir, Jean, Simona, Jessalyn, congratulations on a tremendous publication. We will collectively keep championing this. I um, appreciate everyone's time today. It was a terrific discussion um, and look forward to continuing to forge ahead. Bye.